have a Bible with you, I'd love it if you turn to Matthew chapter 5. Welcome back. Good to have you. Um, we're going to be continuing the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' vision for, for living, for godliness. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, his manifesto for living. And uh, just we begin, I don't know if any of you have been aware of the last couple of days, there's been some incredible sports results. What? I'm not going to talk about... <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Manchester United because I don't want to give you that kind of pleasure. But for those of you who saw uh, overnight the young British tennis player Raducanu, Emma Raducanu won the US Open at 18, which made me think, gosh, what have I been doing with my life? And um, I realized something. Playing not as much tennis as she has is one of the things that I have uh, not been doing. And someone said this to me recently, which I found really helpful. If we want the lifestyle, if we want the life of Jesus, we have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. I would love the life of a Grand Slam tennis champion, but I'm not up for the lifestyle. Like, I'm not getting up to do 10 hours of practice every day. I'm not just going to hit backhand after backhand practicing. Yeah, I quite want the life, if I'm honest. And I wonder, as we look into this uh, sermon on Jesus teaching about what it means to live, how many of us are up for the lifestyle as much as the life? How many of us are in for that and what does that even begin to look like? So let me read out uh, this passage. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. It will be uh, coming up on the screen for you to read with me or you can just listen along. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now when he, this is Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor and spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Help us, help to shape us into your image. Lord, help us to have open ears and open hearts to what you want to say to us this morning, we pray. Amen. So last week we began looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching of Jesus found in the book of Matthew. And we said that this was Jesus beginning to reorder the world. But those who could never count themselves in for God's blessing were all of a sudden brought in. Those not good enough, thank the Lord, find themselves recipients of God's blessing and brought in. And that's beautiful and powerful. But this week I want us to look at why. Why would he do that? What's, what's the objective behind that? What's the point of all this? And as we start, I just want to make a, what I find a fascinating observation that Jesus talks about blessing before he talks about behavior. In church, we often talk about how we want to uh, make people belong before we expect them to behave. Or we, ask, we say, would you belong before you believe what we do and behave how we do? But Jesus takes it a step even further back. Before they're even part of the fabric, before they've even had a chance to feel like they belong, he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless. So before anything is laid on us in terms of expectation, Jesus is saying, I want to bless you. Because remember, this list wasn't an aspirational list of things we're meant to become. You're not meant to go away from here going, I'm just going to <clears throat> find things to mourn about. Or I'm going to make myself even poorer. Or I'm just going to start being meek. That, it's not aspirational, but rather saying when you're in this place, you're blessed. And the blessing of this passage leads somewhere. It's blessing first, but then a whole new way to be human second. The invitation is offered and the lifestyle comes next. 
whenever I talk to people about the Sermon on the Mount, and I talk about it a lot because I'm really into this passage. I love it. And I've been trying to learn it, and I've been trying to learn it by heart, and I'm just not getting it. I'm about 80% in, and I can't do the last bit. I keep forgetting bits. But I love this passage. And whenever I mention it to people, they go, that's a really high standard for living. That's crazily high. And we begin to think of, you know, this can't be it. So what can I do? Like this must be just some sort of fallacy. But Jesus doesn't start there. Before we're called to, to come to Jesus and do what he says, we're called into blessing. We're blessed before an expe- expectation on who we become. We're invited to follow before we change as people. And you're ex- accepted exactly who you are. But there's a reason to that. But God doesn't just care about who you are now. He cares about who you're becoming. And I think even more staggering than Jesus accepting us as we are is that he does so with the intention that we would grow and develop and become the kinds of people who are conduits for God's kingdom breaking in, which is a fancy way of saying through you and I, the way we work, the way we love, the way we act, the way we do family, that the world is meant to be recipients of all that God is about. But this is something I think we've had... uh, a hard time understanding. I think in a strange way we have turned the calling of Jesus upside down. And can we just put up the slide on this? I just want to walk through this. Typically in our churches we have what I call the high bar version of Christianity. Have we got this slide? Where's Chikwaza? (laughs) Chikwaza, can you find this slide for me? If not, I'll just explain with my hands. Hopefully it'll come up. We have this version of Christianity where we have the access point has this really high bar. And we say, you need to get to this place before you're in. Basically, you need to look like us. Well, not like me, but like Chikwaza, maybe. But you need to look like us. You need to act like we do. You need to smell like us. Agree with all our practices and all our doctrines. And then we'll let you in. That's basically how we operate as church often. So unless you're kind of like us, we don't really want you in. And there's a presumption that this will happen overnight. And once you're in, the life we call people to is really low. So we have a high bar of access. And once you're in, the life we call people to is really low. We basically say, can you come on a Sunday? Can you lead a morally defensible life? Like, don't get caught drunk on Instagram, but lead a morally defensible life. Not morally good, by the way, morally defensible. And can you give and maybe serve if you're really keen? And then just wait around until you go to heaven. So this high bar of access and this low calling. So like what we're called to is quite small. And we have a generation of people saying, is that it? Is that the wonderful news of Jesus? That you're, you're dragging me along to the Alpha course. You're, you're trying to get me to come along on a Sunday morning just so I can kind of be good and come along on a Sunday? Is that it? Until I die and hopefully go to heaven. And people are walking away saying, the church doesn't care about what I care about. In fact, the church doesn't seem to care about much. But Jesus does something really different. Jesus has this really low point of access. He turns to people and says, hey, come follow me. He turns to a couple of bum fishermen to a a tax collector, to a zealot, and says, hey, come and follow me. And for sure, this was wrapped up in all the things that Jesus thought they would become. But essentially, the bar to access Jesus was really low. But the life that Jesus calls them and us to is, is right up here. It's the Sermon on the Mount, living. It says living, and we flick through in the next couple of pages. Um, You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at another woman lustfully has already committed adultery in our heart. Guys, how are we doing on that? Some of you look really awkward. (laughs) Don't break your oath. I tell you, don't do that. Eye for an eye. Love your enemies. Give to those who need. Don't turn away from those who need you. These are the things that Jesus calls us to. And the life of Jesus is right up here. To be like Jesus, do the things that he did to love the poor, practice healing the sick, to act the way that Jesus does. That sounds crazy. But Jesus knows that this will take the power of the Holy Spirit to do, 
Like, you can't do this on your own. It will take a whole lifetime. This is the apprenticeship you'll never graduate from. From those of you who are like, are good at finishing tasks, I'm sorry. If you're like me and you're not very good at finishing tasks, we're okay with that. It will take a community around you and you'll have to practice. And this vision of God's blessing to us, this story breaks in so that we can do this journey. And the journey starts with this low bar of, hey, come and follow me. And it starts by God coming close. We read in this passage the story of God coming close. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Typically our concept of heaven is that heaven is, is out there, like far away, and not for now. Possibly in a different dimension, but certainly beyond the stars that we can see. But as we look through the Bible, this is not the only sense, or even the most common sense of the word heavens. And it's not the sense of the word heavens in which we see on the Sermon on the Mount. Twice in this passage, Jesus talks about the kingdom of the heavens. And this is not a yearning for a distant place, but the present reality of something up close, the power and the presence of God. We read it later, our Father in heaven. And many of us have taken that to be a, a calling out to some being that's far away, but actually the writer is saying, this is a calling out to someone who comes up close and gets alongside the kingdom of heaven is perhaps better thought of as God's living and active presence amongst us. In a biblical sense, more often than not, the term heavens conveys the physical presence around us. Thus, God can say later on in this, in this sermon, do not worry about your physical needs because he comes close to walk in that with us. But this isn't just that God comes close. The reality of what life in God is comes close as well. We become bearers of the kingdom of God and our role becomes people strengthened by God to extend his kingdom across our world. That's why what you do on a Monday counts as much as what you do on a Sunday. I always tell people any idiot can be a Christian in church on a Sunday. What really matters is what you're like when you drive out of here. I was so naughty the other week. I drove past the church while we're here and someone screeched out of, of these church gates in front of me and waved their hand at me and cut in in front of me. I said, so, so I went into the church car park and said, do you, do you realize that people in your church drive like this? And then I came to our church. I was like, actually, someone's going to turn up and do that to our church someday, aren't they? Dallas Willard says this, the damage done to our practical faith in Christ and in his government at hand by confusing heaven with a place in distant or outer space or even beyond space is incalculable. That's how bad the damage is. Of course God is there too. But instead of heaven and God also being always present with us as Jesus shows them to be, we invariably take them to be located far away and at a much later time. Not here and not now. And we should then be surprised to feel ourselves alone. As we begin to see that God comes close, we realize that all the enormity that God is calling us to is because God is alongside. The kingdom of the heavens is a place, but perhaps a better way of putting it is it's a reality. Jesus comes close. But what does that look like? In reality, I think it's a good question. I heard a story recently of a missionary in, in uh, Namibia. And uh, she cycled uh, 30 kilometers every day to uh, where she was uh, serving and working. And there were rumors of uh, bandits attacking people. And uh, particularly people kind of out on their own. And she just prayed faithfully, said, God, I've got to travel on my own every day on my bike. Would you just protect me? She was doing some prison ministry and she came across some of these um, bandits that had been attacking in the local area. And she went up um, to one of them and said, I've cycled every day for the past five years, Pastor Haven. You've never attacked me. And they said, we wouldn't dare. You were surrounded by so many people, we couldn't get close to you. 
a girl in our church community confirmed to her parents that moving schools and location was of God by saying, when do I get the, u- the red and the blue uniform for school, despite the fact they'd never spoken to her about where she was going to school or what it even looked like. My son had been coming to me and said, Papa, I want to hear from God. I want to hear what he has to say. We always talk in church about how God wants to speak to us, and I want to hear that. So we began praying each night. We'd, we'd pray together, God, would you speak to Wilbur? He came running into my room one morning. He said, God spoke to me last night. I said, wow, what did he say? And I'd had such a tough week, a rubbish week. I felt so down. I was just, I was just done with everything. He came in. He said, Papa, the two things he wants to say. I said, what is it? He said, firstly, he said, we need to go and splash in muddy puddles because that's so much fun. I said, I'm glad he said that. I said, what else did he say? He said, it's, it's funny, Papa, but he just wanted to tell you that you're loved. Our children can teach so much about faith. Testimonies of God coming close. We moved to Nairobi. We felt that we should move to Nairobi from the school we'd been teaching at. We had no house. Um, we had nothing to put in our house, and we had no job. But we felt like we were meant to be here. And I'd come down to visit a friend, and I walked into this house. And in probably the only time in my life, I felt this just word from God saying, you're meant to live in this house. So I went and told Abby this, and she said, that's weird. There's a guy living there. I'm not going to move in with a 65-year-old guy and us two. That just sounds a bit odd. And plus, he was barking mad. So, we, we, well, let's put that down as plan B, shall we? And I didn't say anything. I said, oh, Abby, I, th- I think this is where we're meant to live. So anyway, um, Dee, bless her, we'd, we'd got to know Dee. And we said, um, so we, we might be moving to Nairobi. Could you, could you try and find us a house? What I was really saying was, we'd love to live where you live. And she kept sending us all the details of other houses around Karen in different places. And... I got all these phone numbers, and Abby was like, okay, you've got some time, why don't you ring? And I never rang any of them, because I just didn't feel that it was right. And so it was getting closer and closer to the time we were moving to Nairobi, and I got a phone call. I got a phone call from my friend. He said, I've just been offered a job in South Africa. I've got to move in a couple of months. Do you want me to put in a good word with the landlady and landlord and see if you can move here? I said, that sounds like a good idea. So he says, "I'll, I'll talk to them. And we were going to be moving into this house. But we currently, at the time, we had a bookshelf. We didn't have any books, but we had a bookshelf. I don't know why. And we had a rug that went on the floor. And that's all we had. And so we were not quite sure how we were going to kind of furnish this house. And he said, I'm selling everything I've got in my house. I'm going to start again in South Africa. Come down and see what you want. And Abby and I, we'd given everything we had to set up the charity we were running. We didn't have a bean at all to offer. So we went into uh, Dan to stay for the weekend and I, I was going to go say to him, look, perhaps we could take some and we'll just pay you back over time or something like that. So anyway, we'd gone to stay. He was having the sale and invited loads of people in to come and check out his house and, and buy the stuff. And he came across the morning of the sale and said, I had this dream last night. I think God wants me to give you everything in my house. And I just, <laughs> this is my faith. I went, everything? <clears throat> Abby was like, oh, the oven. And I'm like, the widescreen TV? <laughs> and I just remember, I remember this is how unholy I am. I said, did he say anything about the car? <laughs> Apparently, he didn't say anything about the car. We had said, God, just show us if you want us to be in this place. And he showed us, he showed his hand in incredible ways that we could never have orchestrated. The life will call to us, the one where God comes close. And finally, as we step into the rest of the sermon over the coming weeks, this manifesto for living, we see that it's about a low point of entry. Come as you are. An invitation to all, but with a purpose. A close and personal God to who we're going to become, but we're not zapped into being that person in a moment of decision. Sadly, we don't just become all that God wants us to be in one moment. 
And we're not meant to be. That's not the way of the kingdom. Finally, I think this is about transforming living and not transformed living. Someone once said that the best gift you can give people is your transforming self. Not your refusal to transform or your already transformed self, but your transforming self. That's the best gift you can give people. And this vision of the kingdom of the heavens throughout the next few chapters, what humans can be makes sense as we see God breaking into the world. That we're meant to grow into this. Modern Christianity thinking has often leaves us with two polar opposites in our theology. On one hand, we have the perfection of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, we have the sinful nature of man. And they're kind of in these two boxes that that can't go anywhere. And the idea is that there's nothing in between them. So because we can never get to the point where Jesus is, despite what he says in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's, you know, some of it's quite clear. It says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. But because we feel we can never get to where Jesus is, we feel bound to the place we currently are. And so the standards that Jesus sets forth are seen as kind of ethical hyperbole or pie in the sky, just dreams. They're not reality for humanity. But Jesus says, be perfect. So what did Jesus mean? I think Jesus meant we're on a journey. We're on a journey of transformation. You're not meant to come to Jesus with everything figured out, but that's not where we stop. We're meant to be going somewhere, learning, growing, becoming more and more like Jesus. There is space between simple humanity and the perfection of Jesus. There is space in there. We hear wonderful verses like, all of sin falls short of the glory of God, and I recognize that so deeply in my own life. But I hope that there are times when I'm less sinful than I once was. As I reflect on my own Christian journey, I'm not all I hope to be or that I think God wants me to be, but I'm not, by God's grace, the person I once was. This thinking's had a huge paralyzing effect on the church. We, in effect, lose discipleship and apprenticeship to Jesus. We lose a sense of growing, of developing, of becoming more and more like the person of Jesus. And what Jesus is going to unpack in the next few chapters will only make sense if the goal of Christianity Christianity is to know Jesus, to grow like him, and to do what he did. It will not make sense if the goal of the Christian life is to make a decision. We must realize that there's more than just being sinful or perfect. There is a space in between, and some of us are growing closer to Jesus. So I think it looks a bit like this. I don't know if we've got the slide, but where there's a line between where we can move. There we go. We'll get to that one in a minute. (laughs) So how do we piece together a vision for godly living, this low bar, high entry? We revisit the idea we saw at the beginning, this low bar, an incredible journey. But this happens in practice, in closeness to him through his Holy Spirit, in a growing sense of what it means to be his people. But there's a reality check to this. The truth of the matter that becoming like Jesus actually looks like this. There we go. That's the line. That's the reality of our life in Jesus finding ourselves sometimes worse than we were. Stepping outside of community, even when we know it's good for us. Doing better sometimes and other times messing up completely. Teresa of Avila, one of the kind of 16th century uh, mystics, says, no one gets so good at this journey that they don't at some point go back to the start. And she was phenomenal, so I'm encouraged by that. We essentially learn to stumble the way of the cross. But we learn. And we grow and we journey to become more like the kinds of people through whom God can use, work in and bring about his kingdom in the work we do, in the vocations of our hands, in our families, in our communities, our schools, in our living. And as we practice the way of Jesus, as we know him, grow like him and do what he did, we will see the renewal of our city. In Jesus' name. We'll see that. We're going to just spend a a few moments just discussing some of these things. Um, And we just got some discussion questions. And I just, as I reflect on this, I was wondering which bits of my life feel most disconnected from Jesus and why is that? 
because I get some of this. And there are other times I go, I don't get how this bit of my life connects into this. And I just want us to begin thinking on that. And then what areas of life might Jesus want me to be growing in at the moment? If it's not seen as a decision, but seen as a journey of growth, what area might Jesus be calling me to grow in at the moment? So guys, you can either just reflect on your own. There's some coffee and tea uh, there you can just grab. Um, we're just going to take some time, or you can sit in little groups and just reflect on these questions together. We don't want to engage rather than just consume sermons. Um, so let's uh, spend a few minutes doing that, and then we'll worship together.